<clears throat> Let me know if you can see this screen now. Okay, good. I never used to be troubled by the narrative of Abraham's test in Genesis 22, known in Jewish tradition as the Akedah, if you're a Sephardi, or the Akedah, if you're Ashkenazi. It's called the binding of Isaac, Akedat Yitzhak. Like most Christians and Jews, and like many academic uh, theologians and biblical scholars, I simply accepted Abraham's response to God as a model of faithful obedience. In recent times, more and more theologians uh, and biblical scholars, both Jewish and Christian, have admitted an unease with what seems to be Abraham's blind obedience to God, an obedience that includes being willing to kill his very own son. And those who let their uneasiness guide their interpretation of Genesis 22 have often believed they were reading against the grain of the text exercising a hermeneutic of suspicion, protesting what they assume the text clearly teaches, namely Abraham as a positive model of faithfulness to God. Now, I myself have come to reconsider the meaning of Genesis 22, specifically whether we should valorize Abraham's response to God. My initial suspicions were based on my own experience of God and my reflections on what I would do if I were quote unquote tested in this way. If I ever heard a voice, internal or external, telling me to sacrifice my son to prove my faithfulness to God, I certainly would not, at least not immediately and without further deliberation, comply as Abraham seems to have. Minimally, I'd question this voice. There is significant biblical precedent not to acquiesce voicelessly in a situation you think is wrong or unjust. The canonical witness of scripture, including the Lament Psalms, Moses vigorous arguing with God at the golden calf, Job's extensive protest about his suffering, the complaints of the prophets Habakkuk, Jeremiah, and others, Jesus' own prayers in the garden as he anticipates his death, and then again on the cross. In all of these ways, canonical scripture provides normative precedent for speaking out directly to God, challenging God over what you perceive as wrong in your life or in the world around you. Just four chapters before the Akedah in Genesis 18, Abraham does exactly that. There we find an extended dialogue between Abraham and God in which Abraham questions whether it is right for God to destroy Sodom if there are righteous people living there. I'm gonna come back to Genesis 18, but here I want to note a contrast between Abraham's active and passionate intercession in Genesis 18 over the fate of Sodom and his potential silence in Genesis 22 over the fate of his own son and his own role in that fate. Why couldn't Abraham have spoken up in Genesis 22 and said, like he did earlier, far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? Or as Job did, far be it from me to say you are right. Until I die, I will not put away my integrity. Or as Jesus said, take this cup from me. Or maybe, quoting Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? So in this paper, I'm going to join the chorus of contemporary voices who propose a critical reading of the Akedah. However, I'm going to account for my skepticism about Abraham in Genesis 22 on internal, inner biblical grounds, the world within the text. I want to do exegesis, not ideological criticism. Or to use Jewish terminology, I want to propose a Peshat reading of the text rather than a Midrashic reading. This paper is part of a larger project. My Indian just work in China. Yeah. Part of a larger project, a book I've just completed called Abraham's Silence, which examines the Akedah in light of biblical models of vigorous prayer, with chapters on the Lament Psalms, the intercessory prayers of Moses and the prophets, and the protests of Job. This book has three chapters on the Akedah, but I'm going to present only the core of my argument and a compressed core at that for why I think Abraham did not pass the test. This is going to require an alternative proposal of what is being tested, which means we need to turn to a contextual reading of the Akedah, a reading in light of the broader Abraham story. And let me just ask you now, are you seeing my entire screen properly? No, you're not. Look at that. I didn't have it right. Now you can, it's larger. Okay, you can see it better. Suddenly it just struck me. Okay. So one common way of reading the Abraham story is to follow the narrative arc of promise, delay, and fulfillment, especially the promise concerning Abraham's descendants through whom his line would continue, by whom the nations would bless themselves or bless each other. 
This narrative arc moves through various articulations of the promise. Then Sarah's barrenness. Then the attempt to produce a son through Hagar. Then God's specification that the heir will come through Sarah, followed by a prediction that this would all happen quite shortly. And finally, in chapter 21, the birth of Isaac. Now, the narrative arc of the Abraham story as an arc about the promised son reaches its culmination in Genesis 21, which is prior to the Akedah. This raises the question of why we need the story of Genesis 21. What exactly is the function of the Akedah in the larger Abraham story? The traditional interpretation, which I respect, but respectfully challenge, is that Abraham is being tested for his willingness to give up the child of promise, the very one through whom future blessing would come. It's a test, in other words, of Abraham's wholehearted commitment to God, placing this commitment above every earthly value, even God's promise of an heir. And here we may compare the two parallel leave takings to which Abraham is called, linked by the repetition of lech lecha, possibly rendered as go yourself. In Genesis 12, 1, Abraham is called to leave his family and his home, while in 22, 2, he's called to sacrifice his son. In one case, he's called to make a break with his past. In the second case, he's called to relinquish his future. So this reading certainly has prima facie plausibility. When Israel was tested in the wilderness in Exodus and Numbers, this was to prove their trust in God. And prove here has the sense of bringing out and realizing a potential, prove in practice. The potential could be there, but it might be latent. And the stringent situation of testing can force the one being tested to rise to the occasion, show their mettle, so to speak. So is Abraham being tested to see if he would be willing to give up his son and his future? out of commitment to God. Now, the first problem with this interpretation is ethical. The commitment to God that Abraham has to demonstrate here involves being willing to kill his very own son. How can that be a model of commitment to God? It works only as a model if we abstract from the very particularity of the text to some general axiom about the need for wholehearted obedience to God, an axiom that's obvious from elsewhere in scripture, and we didn't need this text to ground it. So there's an ethical problem. But there's another problem, an exegetical problem. The problem is that it's unclear why this test is needed at all, because the Abraham story gives absolutely no evidence of Abraham's special attachment to Isaac, such that giving him up would prove his commitment to God. Abraham would seem rather attached to Ishmael, which is very clear from chapters 17 and 21. When God tells Abraham that Isaac, not Ishmael, is the one through whom the covenant will be passed, this leads to Abraham's pleading with God not to forget Ishmael. He exclaims, oh, that Ishmael might live in your sight. When Sarah wants him to send Hagar and Ishmael away, in chapter 21, we recall the matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son, that's his son Ishmael. In fact, the account of what happens in Genesis 20 suggests that Abraham is so attached to Ishmael he simply doesn't care about the replacement son that is promised. Abraham had passed Sarah off as his sister in Egypt back in chapter 12. The result was that the Pharaoh took her into his harem. Abraham does this again in chapter 20, this time with the king of Gerar, who takes her into his harem. But this comes after God predicted that there would be a covenant son born, and after God predicted it would happen soon, presumably in the next year. Yet knowing this, Abraham goes ahead and passes off Sarah as his sister a second time, not caring that he might lose her and the promised heir with her. Indeed, she might even be pregnant at the time. So I don't think it's clear that Abraham is attached to Isaac. Could it be that Abraham is being given a chance in chapter 22 to prove his love for Isaac? After all, God's instructions to Abraham contains the following description of Isaac. Your son, your only one, whom you love. Isaac. So maybe Abraham's love for Isaac is being tested, or at least that might be part of the test. Abraham's love for Isaac is not actually stated as a fact by the narrator, as is typically assumed by commentators. It occurs in what is effectively a parenthetical description of Isaac in God's instructions to Abraham. We could take the phrase, whom you love, to have the rhetorical force, not of a declarative statement of fact, but rather of suggesting to Abraham that he loves Isaac or attempting to evoke his love for Isaac with a sense of 
You love him, don't you? So prove it by your response to the test. Could it be that Abraham's actions are meant to reveal whether or not he loves Isaac? But what would be evidence of this love? I suggest that Abraham could prove his love for Isaac by speaking out and protesting God's command to sacrifice him. Speaking out on behalf of Isaac might even extend and deepen an incipient love that he might have for his son, because testing often brings to the surface and makes actual what's only potential. Why, why this interpretation occurred to me was because as I read further, I found that the phrase, your son, your only son is repeated by the angel of Yahweh in verses 12 and 16, but we do not find a repetition of whom you love. These verses affirm Abraham's fear of God and obedience of the divine word, but he has not withheld his son, his only one. Given that he's just attempted to sacrifice Isaac, it makes sense that this God-fearing obedience would not qualify as love for Isaac. So the phrase is omitted. So I think we need to re rethink what Yahweh said, means when he says through the angel, now I know you're a God-fearer since you've not withheld your son, your only one from me. The statement describes what was discovered through the testing, but it is a logical fallacy to infer that was the purpose of the test if we have reason to believe otherwise. A professor may say to a student after a test, now I know that you are a C student. But that doesn't mean that was the purpose of the test. The professor was hoping the student would put some effort into it and get an A. With this in mind, I'm gonna suggest that Abraham was not being tested for his unquestioning obedience. That's not something that God wants, but rather he was being tested for his discernment of God's character. I agree that he's being tested for his trust in God, but genuine trust is not equivalent to blind faith to do anything a voice from heaven tells you. Trust in God requires knowledge or discernment of the sort of God this is. And here we can note that beside the narrative arc of the promise of descendants, which culminates in the birth of Isaac in chapter 21, there's another narrative arc discernible in the Abraham story. This is the arc of Abraham's growing relationship with God. It's a very important narrative arc since the Abraham story is about the genesis of a new relationship formalized as a covenant in chapters 15 and 17 between a God whom later scripture will distinguish radically from the deities of the nations and a man with no explicit prior knowledge of this God, contrary to a whole bunch of rabbinic midrash. So let's attend to Abraham's developing relationship with God in Genesis. Taking as our cue the seven divine speeches addressed to Abraham between Genesis 12 and 22, God never speaks to Abraham again after that. We may note the ups and downs of Abraham's verbal responses on each occasion. These responses exhibit a growing and then a declining degree of intimacy and confidence in the divine human relationship. Although God speaks to Abraham on two occasions in chapter 12 and once in chapter 13, the first time any verbal response from Abraham is recorded is chapter 15. In that chapter, God speaks multiple times about the promise of an heir and the promise of land. And Abraham responds in both cases with questions, honestly expressing his doubts. And in both cases, God takes his question seriously and responds appropriately to bolster Abraham's faith. God speaks again in chapter 17 about the covenant and circumcision and also about the birth of Isaac through Sarah. In all this, Abraham speaks only once, asking God not to forget about Ishmael, which God agrees to while reiterating the promise about Isaac. At the beginning of chapter 18, when three men visit Abraham and Sarah, there is some recorded speech from Yahweh, distinguished as one among the three concerning Sarah giving birth. No speech of Abraham is reported, but Sarah speaks once in reply to deny she laughed, to which God responds, oh yes, you did laugh. Then comes the extended dialogue between God and Abraham in Genesis 18. God reveals his intentions about Sodom to Abraham, which generates Abraham's bold upbraiding of God about doing what's right, followed by God agreeing to spare the city for the sake of 50. Then Abraham speaks five more times as he brings the number down and each time God agrees. Finally, in Genesis 22, Ha Elohim, not Yahweh, for the first time in any of the speech introductions, God is not introduced as Yahweh, but as Ha Elohim, God or the deity, addresses Abraham twice at the beginning of the narrative and twice more through an angel from heaven. In all this, Abraham says only one word, Hineni, here I am. Says it twice. 
Now, what is the nature of this God whom Abraham is coming to know? In all the reported dialogues between Yahweh and Abraham, Yahweh is shown to be a God who listens to his servant and tries to address his articulated needs. And in the case of the rescue of Lot, even his unarticulated needs. So one way to think of this relational narrative arc is that it has to do with Abraham's coming to understand the nature and character of the God who called him out of Haran. And the sign of Abraham's growing or diminishing discernment of God's character is his willingness to speak up in the matter of later psalmists and prophets, articulating his own needs and interceding on behalf of others. This makes sense of the intentional opportunity God provides Abraham in chapter 18 to learn more about divine mercy through the process of intercession that he might teach his children and his household the way of Yahweh. Here it is worth pausing to understand what's going on in Genesis 18, because this episode sets us up for chapter 22. In Genesis 18, three men, Nashim, have visited Abraham's camp and predicted that Sarah will have a son. Two of them, angels, it turns out, depart for Sodom, while the third, who is Yahweh himself, remains, so he has something to tell Abraham. Yahweh muses to himself, shall I sh hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? That is concerning the cry of Sodom that's come to him. Yahweh decides to inform Abraham of this cry that he may charge his children and his household after him to keep the way of Yahweh by doing righteousness and justice. Tzedakah um mishpat. When God tells Abraham that he's going down to see if the cry he's heard demands judgment, if not, I will know, he says, he waits on Abraham's response. But Abraham over interprets God's statement that he's going to examine the situation in Sodom to mean God's already decided to destroy the city, which where Nebi Lot is living. No doubt his assumption is partly due to the reputation of Sodom alluded to in Genesis 13 and 14. It's possibly also due to Abraham's assumptions about the character of God and what constitutes God's righteousness and justice. But notice, this is precisely what God wants to teach Abraham by revealing his intentions about Sodom. God wants Abraham to be able to instruct his children and his household in the way of Yahweh, so they will do righteousness and justice. But what this means is that Abraham must first himself be instructed in God's righteous ways. Abraham does indeed intercede on behalf of Sodom, upbraiding God for unjustly planning to destroy the righteous or the innocent, along with the wicked, and encouraging God to do what's right and just. He challenges God despite being, as he puts it, just dust and ashes. In a series of requests that God saved the city initially for the sake of 50 righteous, which he eventually ratchets down to 10 as his last offer, Abraham tests the extent of God's mercy and God accedes to each request. Contrary to a traditional reading of this passage, there is no bargaining or bartering or haggling going on here, since bartering involves two people starting at opposite ends a meeting in the middle. The dialogue in Genesis 18 is different. Abraham makes an opening offer of 50. God says, sure. Abraham says, how about 45? God says, fine. Abraham proposes 40. God agrees. Then Abraham drops the price by 10 instead of five and offers 30. God says, let's do it. Abraham offers 20. God agrees. Then Abraham says, I got one final offer. How about 10? God says, 10 it is. Here's my question. What's God trying to teach Abraham about the way of Yahweh from this exchange? If I were selling a used car, and this is my approach, it means I want to give away the car. So just say at the last bit, can I have the car for free? And I say, sure, take it. It's as if Yahweh is looking for an excuse to save Sodom and Lot. Jeremiah 5.1 suggests that God might forestall destruction of a wicked city for just one righteous person. That Abraham stops at 10 suggests he hasn't fully plumbed the depths of divine mercy. He has not yet learned what God wants to teach him. Nevertheless, God rescues Lot and his family through the angelic agency that he sent, even though Abraham hadn't thought to ask for that outright. At what, one point during the rescue operation was Lot was lingering in Sodom, the angels seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and left him outside the city. When the angels instruct Lot to flee to the hills, he tells them that he can't make it that far. And so he appeals to their favor or mercy, um, their chesed, and he requests refuge in an outlying town, simply asking the angels spare the town for his sake. And they agree without discussion. 
Lot asks on a smaller scale for what Abraham couldn't and is immediately granted. So the question is, why couldn't Abraham simply have asked God to spare Sodom for the sake of Lot and his family? That's the un unarticulated point behind it. Perhaps he didn't think God was that merciful. So at the end of his dialogue with God in chapter 18, Abraham has not quite learned what God wanted to teach him, even though Lot and his family have been saved. So we may frame the question that wends its way through the Abraham story as follows. How will Abraham be able to distinguish this God he's coming to know from the gods of the nations? This sort of discernment will be necessary if Abraham will be equipped to charge his children and household after him to keep the way of Yahweh doing righteousness and justice. In light of the command that Abraham receives in Genesis 22 to sacrifice his son, we may even put the question a little more pointedly. Is the God of Abraham simply one of the pagan deities of Mesopotamia or Canaan that requires child sacrifice as a symbol of allegiance? Abraham assumes he is. Or is he different, a God of mercy and love for his children who is willing to forego judgment even for Sodom for the sake of the righteous? That was something Abraham should have learned so he could pass it on to his children, but he didn't. The lesson was cut short by Abraham himself. So in a final climactic episode of the Abraham story, God gives Abraham another opportunity to learn and grow in the relationship. But God ups the ante this time. He raises the stakes. It's not his nephew Lot who will be destroyed along with Sodom, his home. It's Abraham's own son. And it's not God who will do it. Abraham must do it by his own hand. If anything would force Abraham to speak out, to appeal to the mercy of God, this would be it, one would think. Abraham has the opportunity in this test to protest the command and intercede for his son's life. That would articulate his view of the character and ways of God, both in what he says to God and in the very fact that he says it. It would further show his love for Isaac, which would be a good thing, not an impediment to his commitment to God. But Abraham doesn't speak out, he's silent. Whereas Abraham became silent at the end of his intercession in chapter 18, in Genesis 22, he never gets the conversation off the ground. And his silence speaks volumes. It articulates a view of God as clearly as if he'd used words. He articulates a view of God as a harsh taskmaster who's not to be challenged. And if that's what Abraham learned about God, we may wonder what he passed on to Isaac. Many commentators through the ages have noted that Isaac is missing at the end of the Akedah story. In verse five, Abraham tells his servants that he and the boy will go up the mountain to worship and we will return to you. But the narrator tells us that Abraham returned to his young men, his servants. Abraham, Isaac is conspicuously absent. And this is a very well-crafted narrative in which every detail matters. In the remainder of the Abraham story, there is no evidence that Abraham and Isaac ever see each other or speak to each other again. When Abraham sends a servant to find a bride for Isaac, it is at a distance. He never personally meets Isaac. When the servant brings Rebekah to Isaac, the text tells us he was living in Beher Laharoi in the Negev, in the southernmost extremity of the land. But Abraham lives in Beersheba, which may not be far away, but it's a different geographical spot. The next time they meet, if we may put it that way, is at his funeral, but that's too late for reconciliation. What about Sarah? She's missing at the start of Genesis 22. She's also missing from Abraham's life for the rest of Genesis after chapter 22. The next time Sarah is mentioned, we're told of her death in Hebron where she'd been living. But Abraham travels, presumably from Beersheba to Hebron to bury her. It doesn't seem they've been living together, at least if we attend to the geographical references in Genesis. Did Abraham's attempt to sacrifice Isaac result in Sarah's alienation? It's more complicated than that, but I don't have time to get into that right now. The fact that Abraham comes down the mountain alone and is never reported as seeing Isaac again prompts me to ask if Abraham's attempt to sacrifice his son without even attempting to stand up for the boy and plead with God for his life didn't have the effect of traumatizing Isaac and alienating him from his father. So if God wants Abraham to instruct his children and household in the way of God for righteousness and justice, we do well to ask, what did Isaac learn? from the episode on the mountain. I think we can safely say if Isaac learned anything of the mercy of God, it was through the angel's intervention to stay his father's hand. Ultimately, I think Isaac would be confused, however, about the character of God. And if Abraham's response to God's command affected Isaac negatively, how could we view his response as exemplary?
Wouldn't there be some alternative way to be faithful to God without traumatizing and alienating his son? Later, we are told by God's servant, by Abraham's servant, that, and by the narrator in a genealogy, that Abraham gave all he had to Isaac, I think as compensation for what he went through on the mountain. But it's significant that Abraham never blesses Isaac. It was literally impossible to do since they never met again after chapter 22. In fact, we're told that God blessed Isaac after Abraham's death. God, in a sense, tried to make up for Abraham's failing, but would it, was it ever really made up? What would be the effect on Isaac of the estrangement and the result of lack, the lack of direct blessing from his father? Well, one of the most pronounced effects of this episode in the structure of the book of Genesis is this. We're all familiar with the promises given to the three ancestors of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Here's just a sampling of texts. A triad is found over and over again within the Bible. But the book of Genesis, after the primeval history, consists of the Abraham story, 12 to 25, the Jacob story, 25 to 35, and the Joseph story, 37 to 50, each introduced by reference to the father of the main character. The introductions all begin with these are the generations, the toldot of, and names the father, Terah for the Abraham story, Isaac for the Jacob story, and Jacob for the Joseph story. But there was no heading, these are the toldot of Abraham which would introduce a narrative block about Isaac. Isaac has only one chapter that could be considered his own story in which God blesses him no matter where he goes as if trying to comfort him for what he went through on the mountain. But apart from that chapter, Isaac is only a bit player in either Abraham's story or Jacob's story. He's got no story of his own. Even in the Jacob story, there's no mention of Isaac between the blessing of Jacob and the notice of Isaac's death. He simply disappears. Isaac has no significant actions that advance the narrative of promise. He is a much diminished, shadowy, and insubstantial character in Genesis, which is perhaps to be expected given what he went through on the mountain. One of the most intriguing bits of information we're given that bears on the question of what Isaac learned is found in Genesis 31. In a covenant that he makes with his uncle Laban, he swears by the fear of Isaac, that is the name, that was bequeathed to him from his father about who God is, is the fear, the pachad. This is, what I, this is what Isaac passed on to Jacob by intent or otherwise. And my contextual reading of the Akedah story suggests that this use of fear does not have a positive connotation. That God was to be feared was Abraham's legacy to Isaac. So I'm trying to think that Abraham did not pass a test in Genesis 22. His silent obedience indicated that he did not discern God's merciful character at least until the angel called up the sacrifice. He did not show love for his son by interceding on his behalf. Yes, he did come to understand that God didn't want to sacrifice his son. And if we consider his sacrifice in the ram, an analogy with a makeup test given by a generous professor, we might say in the sense Abraham barely scraped through, but that might be conceding too much. I've only begun to scratch the surface of this topic. I realized I wasn't able to give all the interesting rhetorical signals throughout Genesis 22 that suggest all is not right with God, Abraham, and Isaac in the story. Nor did I have time to examine the two angel speeches in detail. These speeches are usually thought to validate Abraham's response to God. I actually have a plausible alternative reading of those speeches, but for that, you're gonna to have to get my book. Here I need to say that I'm not intending to disparage the long history of interpretation that exalts Abraham for his, his response to God. I respect that tradition. So when I subtitled this paper, Unbinding the Akedah from the Straight Jacket of Tradition, that was not meant to be an insult. In biblical interpretation, no one comes to a text traditionless. Every reader is shaped by a whole series of prior readings and assumptions, and I'm no different. It's impossible for me to offer an alternative reading without standing on the shoulders of many others who've already grappled with its meaning and whose grappling I respect. Yet the question must be asked whether the tradition of prior interpretations, each dependent on their particular historical context and on the assumptions and interests of the interpreters should act as a straitjacket, preventing new and fresh readings of the text. I believe they should not. So if I've attempted to unbind the Akedah from the limitations of traditional readings, my motivation is that a fresh encounter with this ancient text from a new angle, raising new considerations that may not only illuminate its meaning, but renew our experience of God, the God who we believe 
can be encountered precisely through this text. In conclusion, it's my claim that Abraham could have chosen the more excellent way of protest concerning God's command and intercession about his son. That would have had the salutary result of Abraham exhibiting and growing in his discernment of God's merciful character. And I believe it may have demonstrated and even deepened his love for his only remaining son. How might Isaac have turned out if he witnessed his father pleading on his behalf with God's positive response to Abraham's intercession? Would he have returned down the mountain with Abraham? Would he have bequeathed to Jacob a different notion of God than the fear? And would there be a unit of narrative material, perhaps coming between the Ishmael genealogy and the Jacob story, focused on Isaac's life, beginning with, now these are the Toldot of Abraham. Given the way things turned out, we can only imagine. Thank you.